Our next speaker is Dr. Dava Newman, professor at Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is the Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics, Mac Vicker Faculty Fellow, Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Harvard, MIT Health Science and Technology. Dr. Dava, thank you. How are my slides working back there? You guys can hear me, right? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, they're working on my slides, but I've got to tweet you. Say cheese. Let's get people to Mars. All right. Looks a little hard. You guys got to be rowdy because there's some holes in the crowd. Do you have my slides? There we go. I think we're on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. All right. Um, so let's explore. I think the fundamental questions about all exploration are these three. Are we alone? Are there habitable planets? And what about life, present or past? So uh, that's what excites me. This is an incredible image from Hubble. Who's 26 years or younger? Raise your hands. Okay, well, Hubble's been up there your entire lifetime, okay, to discover the secrets of the universe. So I'd like to start with the big picture, and the evidence is mounting. I want to show you a quick two-minute video to, when we talk about Mars, and I'm willing to you know, dedicate the next uh, 20 years, that's all. It's my whole life, trying to get people to Mars. But let's celebrate and take a look at the last 50 years, because we do have some big successes in terms of our rovers and robots, and we have tons. I go to Mars every day with augmented reality, jump into Gale Crater, and think about exploration. So this is the reality. This is what we do today. We just need to bring the whole world with us. So let me uh, show you. I'm only going to show you the successes, truth in advertising. Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints NASA. on Mars. I just wanted to call and say congratulations to the entire the Mars Science Laboratory team and really all of JPL. You guys should be remarkably proud. think about every day, uh, every second, until we get people on Mars, uh, so we can really make it happen. So it really is exp about expanding human presence into the solar system, and Mars, specific my passion, to advance exploration, science, innovation, benefits to all of humanity, and international collaboration. I like those words, because I wrote them. Um, and I think we need to do it all together. And uh, this was our 2015 plan. You know, uh, from 2010 on, everyone said NASA doesn't have a plan, NASA doesn't know where it's going. Okay, well, um, try to get everything together. We said, no, we have a plan, we have a strategy. The, the horizon goal is to Mars. It's unequivocally humans to Mars. That's the horizon goal. 
and there's a three-phase plan to get there. Uh, sorry, I missed the talk yesterday about, you know, why NASA or we, you know, the world. And it's not one nation, and it's not one space agency. It's the world. It's global exploration. We, in order to do this, we all have to do this. So that's my main point. Um, but I would like to talk about it in three phases. Um, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo served us very well. That's why I'm here, probably because the uh, you know, culmination of getting to the moon, the Apollo program. So space station, getting and back to the moon, uh, proving ground, we can you know, now call it pathways, and then Mars. Mars is really hard, so you just don't go there today. So I wanna talk about some of the details. Um, probably everyone in this audience and, and listening, I think is pretty familiar with, this is breakthrough science, right? We knew there was uh, ice on the poles, but now that we have flowing seasonal water, that's huge, right? Not great for our humans yet, hyperchlorates, but it's a huge scientific advance. We have seven assets on Mars today. Mars orbit, MAVEN data, the rovers, the Indian Space Agency has an observer, and ExoMars, Europeans. Again, we're there internationally today. This simulation shows how Mars lost its atmosphere. We know 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere, but 4.5 billion years ago, Earth and Mars are sister planets. 3.5 billion years ago, approximately, what happened? How did Mars lose its atmosphere? There's no global magnetic shield on Mars. Lucky for Earth, spaceship Earth, lucky for us, we have our global magnetic shield. Here's the data from MAVEN that shows you without a global magnetic shield on Mars, in the atmosphere, you see the sun's radiation, solar wind radiation, ablating the ions off of Mars' atmosphere. So we're getting more data all the time. We're understanding more and more about Mars. And why do I care so much? Because that tells us about life here on Earth and potentially life in the, the universe. Okay, so phase one, we're on the space station. I don't know if anyone's here 17 years or younger. I like students to, to participate, yay! Okay, your entire life, then we've had astronauts from all over the world living and working 24-7 on space station. And uh, here's Scott Kelly, you might, you might know. I uh, asked him, Scott, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer. What technology do we need to invest in to get to Mars today? Using space station as a test bed for Mars, how do we do this? So this is what Scott told me. Can you, hello, Scott? No, I'll click it. Yeah, I think the uh, life support systems that, that we need to keep us alive in space are uh, ideal candidates for, for demonstrations for our future journey to Mars, as well as, as, well as uh, space, space suits. We need, I think, new spacesuit technology that uh, you know, requires less maintenance uh, in space and uh, you know, something that's easy, gonna be easier to work in on the surface under the, uh, the Martian gravity. Good answer. Okay, he might know uh, I'm a spacesuit researcher, but still, a life support, a spacesuit, we've gotta keep our people healthy and well. And again, we need to be making these investments today. Um, and it is international. Right now on Space Station, those are the main po uh, partners you see in the flags there, but 95 countries. Have, have participated you know, on international space stations, so it's a great model. Okay, my, my specialty is you know, astronaut performance, biomedical. Um, these uh, astronauts who are up just doing amazing uh, research, uh, studying you know, how do we keep the astronauts safe? You know, musculoskeletal, VIP, the new visual um, interocular pressure, all these kind of things. Um, I've been thinking about astronaut performance for forever. This is on Mir, if anyone remembers, the Russian space station. Um, again, that's where I got uh, you know, my tutelage, if you will, working very closely with the um, great people in Russia. On, they understand human spaceflight as well. You know, we all need to work together. This is a big histogram of two years flying sensors, smart sensors on the Mir space station. And what you see there is astronaut motions, thousands of them. If you look at the bottom, those are in uh, forces, in newtons and uh, pounds, uh, so we don't make any mistakes here. Uh, the point is, you're a different creature. You're floating around in space. You're not a biped. You don't walk and run. You push with a finger. You push off with a toe. And you exert about 10 newtons, 20 newtons of force, an order of magnitude than anything that happens on Earth. So we have to get into a different mindset, especially us engineers, different mindset for designing for space and even Mars, even in a partial gravity environment. That's why I kind of show you this data, um, to learn how to really design and work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about innovation and some work going on both in universities and at NASA. Uh, I called it the new NASA when I had the distinct pleasure to serve two years as a NASA Deputy Administrator because of public-private partnerships. That's disruptive innovation in the business model. Not a lot of new technology on those birds, but um, we're doing business a different way. It's really important. It's a really important, I think, uh, lesson learned 
So I want to show you uh, the framework that I kind of put together pictorially uh, for NASA. Hopefully it'll be sustainable. Four types of innovation defined on the bottom. Just existing technology and existing business model. Continuous innovation. Every day, I think all of us go to work and just want to do a little bit better. Just innovate every day. Okay. Then you can go up the left side to you, the red side. What if you want to change that business model? For the government, it's a new organization. That's public-private partnerships. Let's do it in a new way so we can buy services and get there faster, you know, maybe get there cheaper, but get there just as reliable. On the right side, the dark blue, revolutionary technology. What are the technology breakthroughs? Up on top, what if you transform your organization and your technology at the same time? Transformative innovation, that's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard, that's why it's not so filled in. <laughs> okay, let me show you a few. I'd like to show you a few examples from uh, um, this portfolio. So on the disruptive, citizen science. It's one of my favorite examples. After public-private partnership, citizen science. So Juno, the goddess of Jupiter. We're there now in this hairy, hairy orbit around Jupiter with that radiation environment zooming in, coming out. On the bottom right, that's an image to scale of Earth in the red spot. It was just taken by JunoCam. JunoCam is citizen science. Hey world, where do you want JunoCam to look? Take a picture on, on Jupiter, and that's what happens. It's the largest effort in citizen science going on right now in the world for, for space science. It's amazing. Again, bringing the world into exploration and say, you want to explore Jupiter with us? You know, you're all in. Tell us where to point the camera. All kinds of great citizen science um, to, to highlight and, and going on. So again, that's just kind of changing you know, some of our models, but the way we do things. Um, keep going here. Great. Um, Okay, talk about the technology side now of innovation, the revolutionary technology. I want to talk to you about some of my, my research. Now I'm back at MIT, and uh, we work on suits. Actually, I have, work on four suits. I, can, I have time to tell you maybe about three of the four today really quickly. Some are for helping the astronauts when they're inside the vehicle. So that's IVA, intravehicular activity. This is one known as a skin suit for short. It's a long name. is gravity loading countermeasure suit. What am I doing? Through compression, we're loading from the shoulders down to the feet, and we're recompressing the spine. Because most astronauts get back pain, and you get a lot of musculoskeletal loss. So can we recompress that when you're floating around on space stations? So bottom right is uh, uh, Thomas Pesquet. It, it's a European space agency, likes my technology, so <laughs> it flies as a technology demonstrator with ESA, and there's Peggy Whitson, who just broke all records for any uh, NASA astronaut up on space station and came home last weekend. So, but Thomas and then our team of graduate students and students in the middle flying, you know, on parabolic flights. So this technology is based on an advancement uh, on the penguin suit. You might know the Russian penguin suit. It's not, not comfortable, but I always thought it was a pretty interesting technology to try to have exercise, a bungee cord suit, if you will, to help the astronauts, you know, while they're floating around in, in microgravity. Papers and publications. This is just to note that exact same technology we apply here to, to Earth specifically we're s with some pathology. Can't cure cerebral palsy or things, but these are motor control diseases, so can we help people in terms of their locomotion and movement? So in the lab, we put sensors on you, wearable sensors, watch your biomechanics, your walking, all these kind of things, and this is what we're going after, you know, using some of the same uh, technologies, but again, for, for Earth applications, um, be nice, uh, we, you know, we can do that. We're making some progress on that. More to go. Want to jump to uh, spacesuit. The current system, the current technology is the extravehicular mobility unit. Okay. Um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it is an, an engineering marvel. It keeps people alive. This is Apollo in the middle. A little Apollo no. universe. Dad, that's, that's Jack Smith. The Jack only Smith having a few problems. The only scientist we sent to the moon, right? It's our experience with uh, walking around, and, and, and here's another one. Oh, the soundtrack's on this one. This is actually, uh, he's on really high pressure canisters, you know, on the back there. You don't want those to, to go off. So, tough to do science, right? Pretty, uh, you know, the mobility's h hard. In any current spacesuit we've flown, gas pressurized. On the bottom left, you can see that the hard points, that's an x-ray. I want you to take a look at those, it's called side bearings, uh, the shoulder bearings on the suit. We have a lot of astronaut injuries. Matter of fact, 26 shoulder surgeries to date. They're training injuries, not orbit injuries. So that's a problem. So we're trying to address that. Kind of call it a suit within a suit. Using the conventional gas pressurized suit, what can we do as researchers you know, and technologists? Suit within a suit. Want to provide 
injury protection and padding. So we study and we quantify astronaut motion. Again, it's a training injury. When you're in the neutral buoyancy tank doing 10, 12 hours of practice for every one hour on orbit, you're using muscles you don't usually use, you're in one gravity, you're upside down inverted, it's, it's hard, and uh, the wear and tear. So I mentioned my colleagues, we've invented uh, these new pressure sensor system. It's called the octopus, because you're gonna put it on your arms or, or legs or wherever you wanna measure. Here it is in NASA's current uh, Mark III, kind of their advanced uh, Mars suit, if you will. Has a little, this suit is gas pressurized, has a little bit better mobility than the Apollo and the other suit, but still, limited. So our sensors are inside. Uh, this is at Johnson Space Center. As you can see, some mobility, uh, you know, not great, but improving. And uh, on Mars, you know, Mars is crazy terrain. You know that. You know, we need to be very, very mobile. Um, the students call this the reverse Macarena, right? <laughs> okay. So I like that. Uh, dancing, dancing in suits, you know. Um, uh, let me show you what the, some of the data. What this is, is I'll show you a little video here. So we have pressure sensors on the person, and we're seeing your contact where the suit is. You know, what are those hot spots? Where could you potentially be injured? And we map that out basically quantitatively. Um, oh, I wanted my little video to play. What are my chances of my video playing? Pretty good, thank you. It's going, no, no, let me click, please. Okay, you guys click. Only one of us gets to click. Your turn. I'm not touching it. It's the left side is the video. If we click once, we should be in business. All right, you guys don't click, let me click. Okay, don't touch anything, it's moving. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, this goes to about 60 kilopascals, just to show you some hot spots. And again, again, kind of mapping it all over the arm, you know, because you move naturally, but then you hit the suit, and now you have to use all your energy to move the suit. Well, you're wasting 75% of your energy. So, you know, that's not the design that, that I prefer. So again, looking at, uh, you know, how can we do that better? But again, quantifying and saying where we want to keep all astronauts safe. So that's what this system is, you know, kind of inside. These are some of our designs. That now they're prototyped, actually, in terms of, uh, Customize airbags, if you will, uh, to help keep astronauts uh, safe. Okay, so now I wanna zip to life. Where are we gonna go to find life? Ocean worlds are a great target, uh, one of my favorite uh, destinations. Click. I'm trying to click here. There we go. So uh, I think you're pretty familiar maybe with uh, some of the recent findings of hydrogen. These plumes coming out of Enceladus are amazing, you know, hydrogen. Um, so we haven't found life, right? But if you wanted food for life, it's like a candy store for microbes, you know? So that's what we see here. So potentially, you know, we have to investigate and look at more. This is, you know, great place to look. These are all the ocean worlds, Earth being in the middle. This is two scale, that's why I like these, these images. Two scale, Earth being the largest. We gotta look at our oceans. Um, and Europa, favorite destination, uh, will be a mission, a clipper, and probably a lander. That's a heat map. So in 2016, got data from, um, from Hubble, said, wow. You know, again, there could be hydrogen um, coming out in the same place, 2014, we saw that. 2016, it was repeated, this is the heat map. So, you know, that's, the evidence is mounting. Where would we look? Where do we wanna go? Are the chemical constituents for life, where are they and where are they in the universe? Um, these are some great places to, to look. So it's getting very exciting, uh, making a lot of progress. Okay, other tr uh, things, exoplanets. Right, 20 years ago, we didn't have a field of exoplanets. Now we have thousands and thousands, and I love these JPL uh, posters, right? Because the artists always envision what these things are. You know, we haven't seen them. It's just a little blip on the, the Doppler screen, right? But, you know, they made uh, Luke Skywalker come to reality. And this is true science. We have the binary system in Kepler-16b. So again, painting the pictures, telling, you know, kind of painting the pictures for humanity of uh, go right along with exploration. TRAPPIST-1 system is unbelievable. I mean, again, these exoplanets, all, all of them right there, uh, you know, so again, incredible exoplanets. Back to Mars. Mars is hard. My video of the rovers showed you the successful landings and exploration of Mars. Well, this is truth in advertising. This is human history trying to get to Mars. It was tough in the 60s and 70s by, by nation, you know, Russia and the US and, and our partners. Um, all the red X's didn't, didn't work out. You know, couldn't even fly by. It was hard to orbit. It's really hard to land. But now look at the last decade. Lots of green checks. We're doing great. It's awesome because everyone's success is our success. 
every mission, every international mission, every success going to Mars is, is humanity success. So that's why I'm so excited about you know, all the recent uh, successes and the orbiters and the landers and, and, and the data and sharing all the data. Like I said, the world has seven assets on Mars today. So back to spacesuits. How are we going to keep our humans alive and well? Um, this is Paul Webb's incredible work, physiologist, you know, an MD who said, let's shrink wrap the astronauts. And people laughed, and he got a little bit of NASA money and came up with this pretty awesome prototype in the 1970s, before spandex, before we had anything we need to do. Again, Mars is hard with humans. I imagine the first mission, let's say four people, the six people, you're going to have to do about 1,000 extravehicular activities, about 1,000 spacewalks in human history. Cumulatively, we've done over 500. You know, we're pushing 550 today. So that's a step change in performance that we need. Uh, so based on that great work, um, came up with the bio suit you might know a little bit about. So that's the third suit I'm going to tell you about. And I want to watch this little animation, um, some of the technology we have. What we've done is uh, Paul Webb thought about, you know, mechanical counterpressure, putting the pressure directly on the skin rather than a big balloon, a big gas pressurized balloon. And uh, then Iberal came up with some pretty interesting in terms of thinking about these lines, if you will, this patterning. Well, what you see on the bottom right, if I put little infinitesimal circles all over your skin, and that's my graduate students have walked around with circles all over their skin for quite some time, and uh, you bend, and you get maximum bend with me, so you guys wake up, you know, little circles all over, you're bending around, you want maximum mobility, those circles will turn elliptical like in this little animation. And be, those two red lines are very special. They're bisecting diameters. So they will pivot, but they will not extend. There's just one pair of them. And you connect all those up in three-dimensional eigenvector math, and voila, you get our patterning. Looks like Spider-Man. We didn't intend to look like Spider-Man. It just came out that way. The math dictates uh, the patterns. And then uh, we, we try to design a suit, try to come up with the materials that give you natural, full human uh, movement. Stresses and strains, this is a strain map, up to 40% strain on the knee there, uh, circumferential, and then the bottom is longitudinal, and you can see plus and minus up to like 40% strain. That's a lot. So then we say what materials give us that. This is the latest work. Now uh, we've used laser scans, we've used motion capture, now we're using digital image correlation to map the whole, all the joints, the whole body. Um, so this is some of our recent uh, publications. Uh, again, so we tattoo you, and we see how you're moving, and now you know everyone, it's a custom suit, and everyone gets their own map or these lines of non-extension. What's so important about those lines of non-extension is an internal skeleton is how I look at it. You put your electronics, your sensors, you measure people along those because they extend very little. The orthogonal direction extends like crazy. That's where you get the movement from. So it's this really wonderful patterning um, that we we basically have the the recipe for, if you will. Now we're putting active materials into the suit. Why? Because I can make a pretty tight suit, and I can get 20 kilopascals, 20% of an atmosphere. I want to get up to 30%. I have to get 30% to keep you alive, and that's, that's the suit design. I can get 20 to 25% with passive elastic materials. We're doing pretty well. We needed 5 to 10 more kilopascals. We do that with active materials, smart zippers. I put on my suit, but I cinch you up, and now I can hit my pressure production. So we do that with some, currently with some shape memory alloys. We're working on this research. It's great research of Brad Holshu, who's now a faculty member at University of Colorado, and uh, this shows some of the recent papers in terms of, again, specifying uh, what, you know, our design reference to really make a mechanical counterpressure system that would give you constant pressure and attain those, uh, those pressures that we need. Okay, so in sum, there's not a typo up here. Little suit just fits my size is 340 meters. Yes, three football fields, <laughs> those lines. <laughs> That's what the pattern is. And uh, so we're trying to maximize mobility. I'll give you all your mobility, but it's a very minimum weight, minimum mass suit. So you're not fighting the suit. The suit is helping you to do your exploration. That's uh, the vision that, that, that we see. Uh, we need to work on the life support system as well. So that's current research going on. Modular life support, very light, packaged kind of like this. I was glad we had the VR talk. I'm a huge fan of augmented reality. You know, it's not a new helmet. Well, we do have a new helmet design. It's a new helmet design. But the smarts there are no longer Google Glass. Uh, what they are is really using, you know, some augmented reality so you help the explorer. It's a day in the life of the Martian explorer. What slopes, what terrain, how much oxygen do I have left? You pour all that information uh, into the explorer and you help them, you know, you maximize their exploration. So I want to end um, 
think I'm doing okay on time, good. Uh, I wanna spend my last time coming back down to Earth. I talk about Mars a lot in the solar system, but uh, Spaceship Earth is my favorite planet. Mars is really cold <laughs> and desolate and extreme. So I think uh, this is from our the NASA's Discover mission. It's a weather buoy in space. It's a big weather buoy in space. You look at the sun, this is at Lagrangian point one, L1, and you say, hey, here's the sun's weather radiation. Hey, Earth, here's what's coming, you know, in 1.6 uh, you know, million kilometers, million miles, here it is. So it's a big space weather buoy. I'm a big sailor. When I talk to you about the a Mars plan in three phases, International Space Station or low Earth orbit, continuing in low Earth orbit, but we need to commercialize it so then the space agencies can put their good money into getting to the moon and getting to Mars. Well, um, phase, these are three phases. And the other thing is being a sailor, low Earth orbit's right there. It's like a day sail, right? Getting to the moon, if you have an emergency from the moon, you know, you're days away. We've circumnavigated, you sail the oceans of the, of the world, we're days away for help. We lost our steering in the Pacific, days away. Getting to Mars, game changer, right? There's no help, you have to be completely autonomous, completely autonomous, all your systems. You know, you're, there's no safe haven back on Earth. So again, another way to think about it, just how far uh, we're going and what it takes to, to get there. So currently, uh, this is pretty timely, right? There's never been two hurricanes with over 150 mile an hour winds, and today, right this second, so think about the people that this is gonna hit. It's really uh, unbelievable. We need all this data. We need better models, of course, but we can't live with all this data to try to help humanity and think about what's happening here on Earth and, and doing our weather and predictions and things like that. So, over 140 years, we've taken a lot of data, Here's the facts, this is in Celsius. I'm gonna show you an animation for 140 years uh, from the average. Yellow and uh, orange is one to two degrees Celsius increase, average temperature, blue, white and blue is one or two degrees below average over the recorded history for global temperature. So 1880 we start. Please raise your hand when you're born. All right, thanks for participating. So I think it covers uh, the span of everybody in the audience. <laughs> okay, so 2016 uh, just set all records for temperature. 2015 set all records for annual temperature. Surpassed 2014. Guess what my prediction is for 2017? We have 12 of 13 months now, monthly averages being exceeded. This is the facts, this is just the data. It's important to think about and uh, I wanna show you what the carbon dioxide emissions are for a year. Of we don't want to go over 400 parts per million, right? Yellow and red are not good. We don't want to be there. Um, well, that's an animation if it, uh, you guys still letting me click. Okay. So draw your attention to um, the Northern Hemisphere. Um, U.S., China, just the whole northern hemisphere, that's where most of us live. And uh, this is carbon dioxide. So this is human uh, emissions, and this is greenhouse, this is trapped greenhouse gases. And I'm showing it to you in the three dimensions. It goes up to 20 kilometers. It goes up to 20 kilometers from 2014 to 2015. You'd prefer not to see any uh, yellow and orange. And there it is, and it's hugely significant. So the data speaks for itself, um, in my opinion. One more piece of data. I had the great pleasure to uh, fly over Antarctica. Uh, it was on the bucket list and then got to go to the South Pole. So circumnavigation took 18 months to get around the world. It took three seconds in the South Pole. It was a little cold. Um, so while we're flying over Greenland and Antarctica, uh, every year until ISAT-2 gets up there because we're missing some information from near space in terms of satellites. So this is a simulation of, of on the top right of uh, Greenland. It's 287 gigatons. I can't even count that high. Let me repeat, 287 gigatons per year of ice loss. Antarctica and Greenland are 99% of the world's freshwater. If Greenland goes, 
if and when Greenland goes. You see the velocity. I like this because it's technical. You see not just how much, but you see the velocity of the melt. That's what we're measuring. This is three times the size of Texas, Greenland is, and this ice shelf. Thanks. Antarctica is losing about 125 gigatons per year. Um, so uh, I think we can do something about it. I'm, I'm the eternal optimist, but again, have to show those. Uh, I take up uh, this charge from Bucky Fuller to make the world work for 100% of humanity the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage of everyone. So uh, welcome to join, uh, or thanks, and, and just continue the discussion. I think it's urgent, I think it's important, and again, it, it's a, uh, all of our exploration also wants to you know, teach us about life here on Earth and protecting our own planet. And I'm out of time, and I ran out right on time. Oh, these are great simulations. And uh, my last slide for you is on steamed. And if I can get one extra minute. Um, I think we need to change the conversation. We've made STEM a thing. I talk to little girls and boys all the time, and they say, STEM's not for me. Well, we've failed, because we made STEM a thing. I want to raise up STEM in the US. I've dedicated my whole career to it, but let's bring in the arts. The journalists, the, the artists, they paint the pictures. We're all in this together. So I don't have the liberty to exclude people. I want everyone, I want little, every girl and boy out there. I bring in the designers. So I think it's really important that we change the discussion. Again, I call it STEAM because be inclusive. No filtering anyone out. Engineering is famous for filtering people out. Don't filter anyone out, filter them all in. Say, you want to get to Mars? Well, guess what? You know, then, then join us. So, so I think it's a really important message that uh, you know, like to end with. You know, we have to be inclusive. Diversity matters. Why? Because it's excellent. Don't you know that we're able? And that alone makes us major. We can all sit at the table. So, Pharrell said it best. Thank you very much.